everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is meteorologist and Forbes senior contributor, Dr. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me, Brittany. I always enjoy talking with you. As you know, hurricane season, the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season, officially kicked off on June 1st. What can we expect? What's the forecast looking like? What can you tell us? The forecast for the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season, according to many experts like NOAA, is for a normal season. But I always caution with that because it only takes one storm if we remember Hurricane Ian from last year. Now, now normal is about 12 to 17 named storms in a given year with about five to nine of those becoming hurricanes and a few of those becoming major hurricanes. So normal is not good. I mean, because in any, any given year, one or two or three storms can be a problem. And there is a slight chance for above normal conditions. We've got competing factors going on. We've got an El Nino establishing itself, which tends to lower hurricane amounts, but we also see warmer than normal uh, Atlantic sea surface temperatures, which tends to give storms a boost when they form. So uh, we're going to have to watch this season closely. I want to talk about all of those interesting factors, but first, when I'm thinking about the big storms I've covered the past few years, I'm thinking Hurricane Ian of 2022, Hurricane Ida of 2021, and Hurricane Michael of 2018, just to name a few. I know you said we're looking like it could be a normal season, but are any of these storms of this magnitude on your radar so far? Well, it's too early to kind of sort of guess or forecast how many major hurricanes we have. But again, uh, some of the early season forecasts are suggesting that we could have uh, anywhere from one to three major storms. It it really uh, will depend on atmospheric conditions later in the season. But again, I want to emphasize I, I, I don't like to get too hung up on seasonal forecasts because in years where below normal activity was expected, we still had deadly and devastating hurricanes. So uh, what I advise people to do is just understand that we have conditions that are conducive to anywhere from a normal to slightly above normal hurricane season. And so that means if you live in coastal communities or places that are affected by these storms, uh, you should be preparing as you normally would. Uh, What concerns me, Brittany, and this is a big issue, There are so many people that live in coastal communities have moved to Florida or Texas or Louisiana or North Carolina that haven't experienced these types of storms. And so I always worry about that novice effect of not being prepared for these types of storms or even hurricane amnesia for those that have lived there and just not experienced a major storm in a while. Let's talk about that because I specifically know quite a few people that moved from New York to Florida. And in New York, you're not really experiencing the same sort of hurricane season as you would in Florida. So what should these people specifically do to prepare for this six month hurricane season? Yeah, it's it, six months at a minimum because we've seen storms outside of that window as well. But yeah, you need to really understand Uh, sort of the nuances of living in a place that experiences hurricanes, understand evacuation routes, have plans, uh, evacuation and emergency plans, have the proper sort uh, sort of ability to fortify your home, understand your insurance and policies and flood insurance policies and so forth, because um, what we know is that hurricanes are devastating events. And many people, even those that are experienced, may not understand that, that, that we're seeing in some cases, on average, uh, a tendency towards perhaps stronger storms or more rapidly intensifying storms, storms that you go to bed to that were cat two or three, and you wake up and they're cat four. So it's just a new ball game. It's a new reality for people in terms of hurricanes. And so uh, be proactive, not reactive when the storm is coming a week away. You can start now preparing. Why do you think it is this new sort of ball game when you go to bed, the storm isn't as bad and you wake up and all of a sudden it's one of those name storms that people are talking about years later? Yeah, so a couple of things, you know, there is some anecdotal evidence, although the scientific literature is still investigating that we are experiencing what we call rapid intensification. Some of those storms you mentioned, Brittany, earlier, uh, like Hurricane Michael and to some degree, uh, uh, Ian, uh, they experience 
rapid intensification in a 24 hour period of time and so can catch people off guard. That's why I advocate that people get prepared for a cat one or cat two storm and don't sleep on those, as we say. Uh, I think people have this sort of uh, sort of sort of misperception that if it's not cat three or cat four or five, I don't have to worry about it. But uh, we know that cat one and cat twos can be dangerous on their own and they can also rapidly intensify, particularly when they hit the particularly warm Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic waters, that's fuel supply. That's like 93 octane fuel to these hurricanes as opposed to the 87 or 89 octane that they may have been used to years ago as our oceans continue to warm. And let me just say, many of us as scientists are really concerned about just how warm the oceans are. They're, they're boiling right now, and that, that's, that's the fuel supply for hurricanes. Let's talk about that. And first, I want viewers who might have moved from New York or somewhere in the north to, to Florida or these coastal communities to realize just because it might be a cat one or cat two storm, it is still ha it still has the potential to be devastating. And two, you mentioned that this warm, boiling ocean water has you concerned. Can you speak more to that? I can. And so I want, I want to make the point also, one of the things we saw with Hurricane Ian that caught many people off guard, and unfortunately we saw many lives lost because of it, people don't really still understand that hurricane cone. They think that the cone means that if it's down the middle, that's where the storm is going. No, that's not what it means. It means that there's a 66% chance that the center of that storm can be anywhere in that cone that we show you on those maps. And so uh, hurricanes aren't points or dots on a map. They're large systems that can impact areas with significant rain, storm surge, um, winds. And so people in coastal communities need to understand that irrespective of the category, but they also need to understand don't take a cat one or cat two for granted. Those storms can be bad enough on their own, but understand that in the last five or so years, we have seen many instances of this rapid intensification uh, dramatic drops in pressure and increases in wind speed over a 24 hour period. So literally as you go overnight, in some cases, even less than that, 12 hours we see. So you have to be on guard for that. Uh, it's a new reality. It's a new narrative. Uh, it's a new normal that I believe we have entered in terms of hurricanes. And so people in coastal communities need to act accordingly. I appreciate the advice, you sounding the alarm a bit there. And you mentioned that warm, boiling ocean water. And for Forbes, you wrote four strange things about the hurricane season already. And you pointed out this Jekyll and Hyde scenario. And obviously, when I heard that, I was like, ooh, that, that doesn't sound good. Because anyone who knows the story of Jekyll and Hyde knows it's a split personality here. Can you speak a little more towards that? Well, what I mean by that is that we have entered an El Nino when the waters in the central Pacific Ocean are warmer than normal. We've been in a La Nina pattern, a cooler than normal pattern for the last several years. El Nino usually means on average less hurricane activity in the Atlantic. I mean, there's a sort of complex connection between the ocean waters and the Pacific and how it affects the atmospheric patterns and jet stream patterns everywhere around the world. But counter to that tendency for El Nino to want to sort of suppress hurricane activity, these warm waters that we've been talking about, Brittany. Uh, and, and again, I use boiling metaphorically, but they're just very warm. And so if hurricanes do form, and they will, uh, I mean, we will get tropical storms and hurricanes forming this year. Uh, they have quite a bit of, of warm water and likely deeper ocean water that's warm to tap into. And that, from a meteorological perspective, I'm a meteorologist, that always concerns me when hurricanes have this rich pool of warm water. And I've also been looking at some of the steering patterns with location of the high pressure in the Atlantic is. And right now I'm seeing some things that concern me about even how those storms could move once they form. We Sometimes the position of that, that high can lead to more what I call fish storms. They just go out to the sea. But in some cases, they actually come a bit closer to the U.S. And so I'm watching how that pattern evolves as well. So what you're saying, is this warm water ammunition for these storms? 
Oh, it's absolutely. Hurricanes feed off of warm water. That's why they typically die when they move inland or even move over cooler waters. Um, if you look at the water temperatures, and I in, in that article that you mentioned that I wrote, I, I, I actually shared a map from someone, a colleague of mine that tweeted a, a map of the uh, sea surface temperatures around the world. And if you look at those temperatures in what we call the main development region or the MDR, that's that region uh, off the coast of Africa uh, in, into the central part of the Atlantic, we call that the MDR, the main development region. Those waters are really hot. And so uh, that just doesn't bode well if these storms can spin themselves up. You also noted in that piece for Forbes that hurricane season starts June 1. On June 2, we saw a named storm, Tropical Storm Arlene. Is it normal for a storm to form this early in the season? No, it, it's not. It was a little early. And now typically the first named storm comes later in June, probably the third in third week of June. So to get a storm literally the day after uh, hurricane season officially began, uh, that was certainly a bit unusual and even more unusual than that. And I mentioned that in the article as well. Uh, Arlene was the first named storm, but uh, the National Hurricane Center actually characterized the name, uh, 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 identified a subtropical system that happened in January. <laughs> Didn't get a name, but it was designated as the first tropical storm, if you will, or tropical system, I will say, uh, of the year. And that's in January, well outside of the hurricane season. So is that more of an anomaly or does this indicate maybe foreshadow anything about the 2023 season? Yeah, I wouldn't sort of go as far as to say it foreshadows anything, but it's certainly an anomaly, Brittany, to get uh, there. I don't know if many of your viewers may remember a few years back, we had a hurricane and Alex back in January. And there have been a few other instances of tropical activity. Uh, what that says to me uh, it, it doesn't say necessarily much about what to expect for this season, but what it says to me is that uh, it continues to be a scenario where a hurricane season, quote unquote, may be meaningless because there we are seeing tropical storms now happen before June, for example, and after December, after November 30th, when the season technically ends. And so uh, I have been keeping an eye on and have written in the past in Forbes about whether the concept a hurricane season is obsolete or becoming so. Do you think at one point in the future, maybe the near future, we could see a hurricane season that's really 12 months out of the year? I, mean, I think we've kind of already seen it. If you go back and look at the record, we've had hurricanes in January and December. Uh, haven't really had uh, too much going on in February and March. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll be 12 months, but I think one of the things we're increasingly seeing and uh, certainly some evidence of that this year is that because of the warm ocean temperatures and some of the cases, how early it's getting warm, warm enough to support hurricane activity, um, yeah, we can start to see tropical storms at least well before June 1st. Dr. Shepard, I always enjoy having you on. And whenever you come on, you always leave our viewers with a piece of advice. I know you gave some advice at the top, but at the end here, as we wrap, what's that one piece, the most important piece of advice you can leave the viewers as we we start the hurricane season of 2023? Well, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to violate your 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 guidance here. Give two quick ones. One is perfect. Just Make, make sure to have uh, a plan and understand your insurance needs. But the second thing is a little bit more subtle. Don't fall a victim to normalcy bias or recency bias. What I mean by that is don't assume because you uh, made it through a storm five years ago or last year, um, the next storm coming is just like that one. Again, a lot of people in Southwest Florida sort of said, well, Hurricane Ian is like Charlie. I made it through that. No, Hurricane Ian was way bigger storm than Charlie. In fact, much of Hurricane Charlie would have fit in the eye of Hurricane Ian. So don't assume the same storm you're experiencing in 2023 is like the storm you've ex experienced in the past. Treat every storm uh, like you treat your kids. They all have their own personalities. That's great advice. So every storm is different. Is that how people should be approaching this hurricane season? We should be approaching it as every storm is different and in some ways, this newer generation of storms may be exhibiting some behavior that we haven't seen in the past because of those warmer ocean temperatures and sort of shifts that we're seeing in our climate system. Dr. Marshall Shepard, per usual, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me.